Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Zero Waste in the Healthcare Sector. I'm going to hand it off to Scott Miller, Director of CE3, to get things started today. Thank you, Alyssa, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Ohio University's Board of School of Leadership and Public Affairs, I'd like to welcome you all to the first webinar in a series on the topic of waste management and corporate sustainability. My name is Scott Miller, and I'm the director of the Buena Vista Schools Consortium for Energy, Economics, and the Environment, also known as CE3. Through today's webinar, entitled Zero Waste in the Healthcare Sector, we're going to explore waste concepts and learn more about best practices in waste management in the healthcare industry. Our experts will discuss a range of issues, including cross-sector synergies and byproduct reuse, implementing a facility-wide zero waste program, and repurposing discarded medical supplies and equipment. Today's topic was spurred through a partnership between the Buena Vista School and our community partners in a collaborative program known as the Appalachia Ohio Zero Waste Initiative. It's funded through the generous support of the Sugarbush Foundation, which is a supporting organization of the Ohio University Foundation. We're very fortunate to work with both of these organizations as we seek to transform the ways in which our region and our society view waste from something that others take care of to something that we all take responsibility for. As always, all of CE3's events and project work, as well as a downloadable version of this webinar, can be found on our website at ohio.edu backslash CE3. I have just a few logistical responsibilities in opening up today's meeting. First, I'd like to extend my thanks to our extremely strong panel of speakers. I hope you enjoy the dialogue, and I feel sure that you're going to take something useful away from this meeting. Second, during the webinar, if you have a question that you would like to submit for our panelists or our staff, we ask that you use the question field on the GoToWebinar navigation pane on the right-hand side of your screen to type a question for our panelists. We will try to get to as many questions as possible during our time together today. And finally, after the webinar, a link to a brief online evaluation will be emailed to you. Please take a few minutes to provide us with some feedback on today's session so that we can learn how to improve for the future. And with that, I think I've covered all of my logistical bases, so it's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, my colleague, John Glazer. John currently serves as the Director of Tech Growth Ohio, an Ohio Third Frontier funded venture development organization housed at Ohio University's Buena Vista School. Tech Growth helps early stage technology companies acquire the resources to accelerate commercialization. Prior to joining Tech Growth in 2008, John served as the CEO of Little Professor Book Centers, a successful bookstore chain and the largest organization of independent bookstores in the US. John also founded several other startup companies and organized a number of technology-based economic development enterprises in the US and internationally. He has an ABD, PhD, and master's degree in philosophy from the University of Michigan. I think you will agree with me that we have a very qualified and capable moderator for our discussion today, so I'm going to step out of the way and turn this webinar over to John and our panelists. So John, the floor is yours. Thanks, Scott. So I'm John Glazer, and I'm going to play the role of host today, introducing our panelists who will be carrying the weight for being our content providers for this webinar. Tech Growth is involved in the Zero Waste Initiative because the tech growth concept, in addition to its environmental, health, public policy, corporate sustainability, and other aspects, also presents economic and entrepreneurial opportunities. And tech growth is pleased to be in the partnership with the Bonevich School and Rural Action on the Zero Waste Initiative in southeastern Ohio. So tech growth provides a wide range of services to innovative entrepreneurs, helping them find, launch, and develop sustainable ventures. And these services include business planning, market studies, customer discovery, financial modeling, go-to-market strategies, and importantly, access to capital. So if you're an entrepreneur looking for opportunities in the zero waste economy, or with technological innovations generally, I encourage you to reach out to Tech Group. Today's webinar focuses on zero waste in the healthcare sector, and our guests span the continuum from community hospital systems to the global health perspectives. We have a wealth of information to share, so let's begin. I'm pleased to present our first panelist, Sydney Weber, who currently serves as Director of Marketing and Communication for the Ohio Health Oblenis Hospital. And she's the chair of the hospital's Sustainability Committee. 
She joined Ohio Health in 2014 and brings more than 25 years of experience in marketing, public relations, corporate communications to her role at the hospital. And before entering the healthcare field, Sydney worked in the publishing industry as the marketing and publicity director for Time Incorporated and for Random House in New York City. So Sydney, thanks for being here and for your presentation and let me turn this over to you. Great. Um, thank you, John. And thanks everybody for being here. I, I feel really um, honored. We're at Atlantis really just on the beginning of our journey to zero waste. So um, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we got started and where we're at right now. So if you want to sli switch the slide. Um, I'll go over the background. Um, I'll talk about what our zero waste pledge was in um, the very beginning, what our process was to get started, um, share some results. Um, we don't have, a, we just launched at the beginning of this year, so we don't have a lot of information, but we do have some. And sort of um, talk about what, what is next for us. Um, so next slide. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge rural action. Um, as a small community hospital, I don't even think we knew how to get started. Um, we met with Rural Action. We were working with them on um, a, another project and, and just asked them what kind of other kinds of things that they did. And they started talking about zero waste. And we started a conversation about what a partnership like to help us launch some basic recycling throughout the hospital. So. Throughout the presentation, when I say the hospital in Oblenis, I, I think we all should keep in the back of our mind that Rural Action has been with us, leading often, um, side by side always, and um, really brought a level of expertise that made everything that we've done possible. So, um, big thank you there. So, a little background. Um, Oblenis is a community hospital. Um, we're registered for a little over 100 beds, but usually we have about 30 inpatients um, at a time. We have close to 800 uh, physician staff and volunteers, not all there at the same time, but it's a, it's a busy place and, and we create a lot of garbage. Um, Athens, for those of you who don't live here, um, it's a very diverse community. We have a university here, so we have a really very progressive environment, but we also are in rural Appalachia. And when you look at our physician staff and volunteers, that is our community is represented in that population. So as we thought about bringing a recycling program to Oblenis, we had to understand that people were going to, to be, um, I guess they were gonna come to that program at really different levels of understanding. Um, so that was really always in the back of our head. Um, we, didn't do a lot of recycling. We were recycling um, cardboard. Uh, we were recycling some shredded, you know, any kind of patient information gets shredded and recycled. Um, we did some light bulbs. It was very scattered. It wasn't really an intentional effort. It was just something that had been done over the years. Um, I think as we thought about recycling and probably why it had never been done at Oblenis was that we sort of thought we would get some pushback. And I, I, you see I say perceived challenge because we actually, when we started the program and started talking about it, people were very excited, very excited, and couldn't, they really wanted to help, and they came to us with a lot of ideas. So that was actually, I think, an obstacle and why it took us so long to get there, but it actually wasn't an obstacle at all when we, when we got to it. So next slide. So this is, these are our numbers, our shameful numbers. We have uh, 32 cubic yards of garbage a day when we started, um, if you will, which is three and a half tons. And that's over 900 tons of trash a year that we were putting into the landfill. And when you think about a hospital, the stuff that goes in the bins is actually not the sum of our waste. And it's certainly, if you look at sustainability as a whole, it's just a very small part. Um, we have medical waste, anything that, that patients touch or contaminated goes somewhere else. We have electronics, which actually we do recycle. Um, patient records, all that kind of stuff is actually not even represented in what you see in our dumpster. So um, it was definitely an issue we needed to tackle. 
And next slide. So in the, in the fall of 2015, um, Athens Hawking Recycling went to single screen. And if you've ever been in a hospital or a large organization, you understand the challenges of sorting trash. It was just really not possible for us to have either separate bins in different locations or ask our housekeeping staff to separate um, bottles from cans to paper. And so when they went um, live with the single screen, we really could say, yes, this is something that we can do. Um, so the first thing we did was we developed a muscle, multidisciplinary champion program. Um, it started out, I think we had 19 people and we still have, it's a pretty active group. And they were charged with helping us launch the program and then sticking with it for the coming years to figure out what do we do next. Um, we are, we pledged to recycle in public areas and also recycle in separate offices. So we, we have not only, you know, hubs in, in the hospital, but we also have um, bins underneath each of the desks with a large recycling can and a very small trash can. Um, we pledged to recycle our batteries. Um, in a hospital setting, if some of the pumps and patient equipment you can only turn the batteries on once. So you may have a machine that's running for five seconds. You have to take the batteries out and dispose of them. You can't use them again. And it's a safety issue. You don't ever want to turn on a machine and not have fresh batteries. So we're, we go through a lot of batteries and finding a solution for recycling them felt really important and impactful. Um, the other thing is we are, we were big uh, users of styrofoam and I cringe saying that we're still using a little styrofoam. We've replaced a lot of our serviceware with paper, um, and but there's still some things that just won't go away. And, and again, it's a big shift for the hospital. Um, and this one, this is still remains a challenge, but we have committed to work on it. So uh, we're working on it. Next slide. Okay, so how did we do it? So we assessed, we planned, we educated, 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 educated. Um, we delivered, uh, and then we communicated. So I think the ass assessment was really important to the success. Um, and this, again, I want to just shout out to Rural Action because they, they brought a lot of leadership to this process. They really looked at how the work is done throughout the hospital and what we needed to succeed. And that's everything from mapping out where the bins were to um, looking at how what the workflow was. Um, they uh, they started helping us research industry regulations um, to help us understand what we could and couldn't recycle. And again, leadership support. Um, they needed to. We all needed to ensure that whatever we did was going to be supported not only financially um, but culturally. Uh, so that was a, a, a really huge part of the project. Um, so they mapped, we budgeted, um, we communicated with our business partners. And I think that was another really important thing is we really engaged our uh, directors and the people that we especially in those departments that we're going to experience a lot of change, facilities and housekeeping, who were going to do the daily work differently. Um, and so once we had them engaged, we knew we could get into um, and go down and educate the staff. And there, I, uh, I don't even know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of training. And if you think about 800 people, I think that's probably the greatest impact that, that we had. You know, what gets recycled, what doesn't get recycled, um, why are we doing it, what does it have, how does it impact our environment. Um, that was really important. We created some educational pieces that, that we handed out with frequently asked questions and started building on those as well. Um, and we delivered. We placed 97 hubs um, across our facilities. We had almost 300 desk side bins. Um, we had several locations that didn't have recycling uh, dumpsters outside the building, so we couldn't recycle in, so we, we fixed that. Um, we created a battery recycling hub, and, and importantly, we really were open to 
um, any kind of suggestion. Um, we really wanted people to be engaged. We built a lot of things from that engagement um, onto our program. Um, we did table, which we call tabling. We set up tables in the cafe when we started rolling out programs to answer any questions. Um, and then we launched with a major communication plan. And if you switch to the next slide. So we had posters. We pretty much took over the hospital as far as communication goes. So we had um, posters and poster holders, which you can see on the left-hand side, um, with some information about what gets recycled. We had digital signage. Um, the two hub signs are on every single one of, one of the signs. So actually, it still looks like the campaign is going because we have so many hubs there. But we felt like it was important because of the diversity of knowledge on our staff to make sure everything we had had really some education about what gets recycled and what doesn't. Um, we gave a to-do list out as sort of a gift when we, the day we launched as we were tabling. You know, to-do list, recycle, and then again, what can be recycled and what can't. Um, we, get, we made little stickers for our EBS team as they're cleaning rooms if they're noticing that some of the, the staff isn't putting the right thing in the right thing. We actually, they could congratulate those people who were doing a good job recycling. Um, and I think the next, is there a next slide? So these were our two uh, Q&As. And if you look at them, things like, uh, what's the impact? Um, what is a zero waste pledge? Can I recycle medical waste? Um, are we recycling in patient rooms? Those are the things that, as a committee, we were sitting around going, I don't know, can we, can we? And we thought that we should collect all that information so that people had it at a glance. Um, importantly to note, we are not recycling in patient rooms right now. There's just a lot we don't know about what health, you know, what health risks there are. It's, it's something that's on our to-do list for a later thing, but we didn't want to tackle that in the initial part of um, our recycling. So this stuck. Um, we are, what, it's starting in July. We're probably six months in, and it is really deeply part of our culture now. We don't, people ask all the time, can I, can I do this, can I do this? You see our environmental services people recycling things that you wouldn't think that they were doing. So um, I, I feel like that was a really successful launch. So next slide. So this is some, uh, sort of based on the EPA's waste reduction model. Um, our savings per week, which is, you know, negative 16 in energy. So you can see the, the calculations there. And then the savings per year. Um, and it's, you know, I look at it and I would say, mm, it's okay. I mean, considering how much we have, I think it's a, it's a good start. Um, but clearly there's more to do. And I think, um, Every day we're, we're adding to that, and, and it will be interesting to see what it looks like at the end of the year. So the next slide. So we have started the second phase of the campaign, and one is to recycle waste. The other thing is let's not create waste. So when we did our initial assessment, it was pretty clear that what was filling up the dumpster was all the stuff from the cafe. So people were eating in the cafe, but they were taking to-go containers. And so we thought that would be some education around that. Again, you know, you can't make people do anything. But we launched this last week, and it was choose to re reuse, we're here to go. So we have digital signage, we have posters. Um, in the cafe, we actually have them stop uh, and say, you know, are you, you know, if you're going to pick up a cup, are you eating here? You're going to go. We've done um, training with the staff to to ask those questions to make sure they don't automatically give somebody a to-go container. But really, if they're eating here, they should be eating off of plates and not taking to-go. We think we can have significant reduction in our trash um, that way. Um, this table tent. 
<laughs> I wanted it to be a little harsher. So I feel like if you're sitting there, if you're, you've got somebody's attention, but what we're trying to say is, you know, you're here, did you, did you take a plate or did you take it to go? And we have some mixed results. We've got some resistance to this, so we're gonna, we're keeping, we're gonna push. Um, because I think it, it's a culture shift that we can do, um, and we're, we're just gonna have to keep, keep at it. So, next slide. So what's next? So packing material and other ideas. So as we're launching this, people are coming up and saying, hey, um, our IT guys, we have these little styrofoam bricks, and we can fill a dumpster in a week. <laughs> like, okay, let's figure out what to do with them. So again, partnership with Rural Action, trying to figure out how do we, they are recyclable, how do we get them to the recycling place? Uh, we started a cafeteria composting um, trial, and it looks like um, that's going to go. We've done a lighting assessment, um, okay. lighting assessment, and we're going to create a sustainability plan for the hospital, and that's in the process. So we'll get to zero waste-ish mm -hmm. at some point soon. So that's that's it. I'm being hurried. <laughs> so, were there any questions? If there are any questions, you should uh, type them into the questions panel on the right side of the display, and we will certainly pick them up as we continue. But thanks, Sydney. Our next panelist is um, Mike Long, and um, Mike brings very deep experience uh, to the problem of waste. He is currently the co-founder of a nonprofit called Sustainable Ohio. This operates, among other things, the Ohio Byproduct Synergy Network, which is a fantastic matchmaking services among businesses to connect one company's waste with another company's feedstock. Uh, he's also currently president of a consulting firm called Resource 100, which focuses on waste reduction, recycling, and conversion of waste into wealth, into products, energy, uh, fuel, and like that. He's also uh, currently a member of the Mount Carmel Health System Green Team, and will be telling us some about that. Mount Carmel is a member of that um, byproduct synergy network. Um, deep experience in the solid waste industry, a founding director of SWACO, the, South, the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio, served in that position for many years, also contributed to the Ohio Department of Transportation and Columbus Director of Public Utilities and, and Aviation, a graduate of Ohio University, um, was on the faculty at Ohio State University as an instructor in municipal and, and industrial waste management. And Mike is going to uh, be the next panelist to present. Mike? Thank you very much for that introduction, John. Um, so if we can see the first slide. the. Um, the Ohio Byproduct Synergy Network <clears throat> is a, a program of a nonprofit, Sustainable Ohio. And we teach companies, as John stated, how one company's waste could become another company's food, literally and figuratively. Uh, it could be their feedstock, their raw materials, their resource. And by treating it as a resource, you can convert it into value and profit or in the case of a nonprofit hospital, reduction in costs. Next slide. So just a couple of quick definitions. Uh, byproduct synergy is the process of matching waste and resources uh, with another facility uh, to create those, uh, those benefits. Now we're going to talk today primarily about wasted resources and materials, but when you start thinking deeper about this, you understand that we could also include uh, energy, heat, uh, excess transportation, uh, anything like that, uh, warehousing, storage capacity, anything that you have left over after your product has been made or the service provided is fair game for thinking about how another enterprise could share uh, in that benefit and turn that waste into a resource. Um, the way we do it in the organization is we, we have members, it's a member-driven organization, and we focus on local and regional issues uh, within that market. Next slide. 
So if you, if you just think about how we used to make things in the United States in, quote, the good old days, uh, we would have material, energy, and water flowing into a manufacturer. We would have a product, in this case, product A, and when we made that product, we would have a waste that typically went to a landfill. Next slide. So what we do with the Byproduct Synergy Network is we try to bring another company into the room, uh, another manufacturer primarily that uh, makes uh, uh, product B, again, using materials, energy, and water. And if you look at the next slide, by thinking of these uh, as a network, what we try to do is turn that waste from company A into a resource, avoid disposal, and instead put that, what you should see as an orange oval, uh, which is principally pro uh, processing, because normally when a material flows out, out of a company as a waste and is bound for a landfill, it is not in a, a, a state to uh, be able to take it immediately into another company. There's usually some sort of intermediate processing that is necessary. Next slide. You may ask, uh, well, this seems so intuitive. I mean, why do we need people teaching us how to do this? Well, there's eight good reasons why it's very difficult. Um, the distance between the, the two facilities, uh, the law, the regulatory environment we, we work in, technical. Uh, people will commonly tell us, I have uh, one of my biggest wastes is wood. Well, it's a big, it's a big deal whether that wood is creosoted lumber or some uh, plywood. Uh, so we need to know a lot about uh, the technical aspects of the materials in order to create a synergy. Next slide. So our organization has a, a network of companies across Ohio. We go through a very structured process where we meet on a regular basis. <clears throat> Excuse me. We help the companies identify potential synergies and we give them tools on how they can manage these materials uh, and create synergies. Next slide. One thing that helps a lot is that we have agreements set up with, uh, with every company that's part of this uh, network. Uh, they're, they're confidential, uh, non-disclosure. It gives us the ability to uh, exchange information across the fence lines. Uh, we try to get regulators such as the high EPA engaged in the beginning so they understand what is going on and uh, if you anybody's interested and looks at our our network and our membership base you'll find a lot of diversity in the types of organizations that are part of that they're traditionally manufacturers but we're very proud and I know Mount Carmel Hospital is very proud that they were the first hospital in the United States to actually join and participate in a byproduct synergy network next slide so as a little self-promotion here, uh, for those of you who may be interested, we are having our kickoff meeting for our seventh year of op operation on August 3rd uh, out at the State Ohio Department of Agriculture building on East Main Street in Reynoldsburg. Uh, it just says, <laughs> missing the word Reynoldsburg there, obviously. But uh, please contact Megan Moses, who's the network director of the, of the Byproducts Energy Network. You can all see her phone number and uh, an email address if you would like to attend that meeting as our guest uh, since this is the kickoff uh, we'll have a we'd like to have a lot of new people and new materials that are bound for the landfill that we can hope turn that around and use it to create jobs in Ohio and and uh, save companies money or increase their profitability so I, I want to thank uh, uh, the webinar folks here for letting me just give this brief introduction to byproduct synergy. If um, you can bring up the next slide, uh, we're going to roll into um, uh, Mount Carmel Health System and and what they're doing to try to achieve zero waste in the health care sector. And I'm going to interject a couple of examples of byproduct synergy in, into uh, the work that Mount Carmel is doing. Next slide. So they are a, uh, Mount Carmel is a very large hospital system in Central Ohio, 8,000 employees. You can see how big they are. They're part of the Trinity Health System from Livonia, Michigan. They are a healthcare, a Catholic healthcare delivery system. And as such, they have a very strong ethic when it comes to protection of the environment 
and, and how that relates to the health of our communities and across the globe. Because of that mandate and, and very significant interest of their employees on environmental sustainability, they have, they've gone a long way down the road towards zero waste. Next slide. What they did uh, with that employee activism and interest, they, they created a team, their green team, uh, which cuts across all of the hospitals, the five hospitals, uh, and their medical group. Uh, from the different departments in all those hospitals and they have a 20 member group and they've added me to their team as, as an advisor and they meet uh, bi-monthly and they've created their own charter and they keep copious notes uh, and minutes and they distribute those out to the green team members and they post it on their website and they have strong leadership approval uh, from the top of the management of the hospital to do this. Next slide. This formation of the green team was, was very important in their success to date and, and their continued success into the future. Because you can see they, they, they have a purpose statement and uh, I highlighted two parts of that. One is they're, they're in the building awareness mode. Uh, they're, they're, they're trying to bring uh, these, these concepts uh, into the system, the hospital system wide but they also are a very active team and they pursue and take action and you're going to see in a minute they are in fact the driving force uh, between these environmental initiatives at uh, Malcolm. Next slide. They also, uh, for those of you who may, may be familiar with the Healthier Hospital Initiative, uh, they, they got involved in that, they took that pledge and you can see the six uh, focus areas of that and they've developed projects uh, over the last three years in every one of those areas that are continuing on into the future. Next slide. Uh, just by way of looking back over the past year, they're, they're maintaining a, a very favorable uh, diversion rate of, of the waste they generate. They're diverting almost 30% uh, away from landfills and uh, that does not include their, their efforts to also um, as part of uh, uh, privacy issues and as well as environmental to divert paper and their electronic records management is in addition to that. Uh, they've also have, have developed a strong relationship with a local uh, e-waste recycler and have processed a lot of uh, metals and electronics uh, over the last year. And they're very proud of their red bag reduction program um, because that does two things. One is it reduces their costs and they're well under what's best practices at 15%. They're now under 5%. But it reduces their operating costs, but it also, uh, and, and protects the environment, but it also, the, the less stuff that goes into the red bag, the more is available for potentially recycling. Um, they also uh, go into our synergy, our byproduct synergy. Uh, they have developed a relationship with the local Pepsi bottler to uh, take refurbished unused and unused drums in a further lab sol solvents. They also use those drums to transport uh, infectious waste to incinerators and they have a, a program to reuse the lab solvent as a degreaser. Uh, and I'm going to show you a couple examples of that here on the next couple slides. Excellent. So, the solvent waste coming out of the labs uh, that's being reused as a product, uh, if you just look at the, the picture at the bottom left, it's placed in the drums and then it's picked up by a transporter. It's used to uh, clean railroad cars uh, and after the cars are cleaned, the spent materials then goes to a fuel blending facility and then it's used for as a fuel in cement kilns. Uh, so this was material that, that originally just went directly to a hazardous waste facility and they're getting those additional uses out of it, uh, saving money and protecting the environment. Now, if you look at the picture of the drum, that has been changed and, I, and uh, I'm going to take care of getting that a, a, a fresher picture of that because they have partnered with the, uh, the Pepsi company, uh, the Little Bottom Company, and what happened is uh, Pepsi was uh, saying um, we got these 55 gallon drums that uh, are going to the landfill 
then they started looking for other uses of those drums like rain barrels. And uh, perhaps it was also part of the Byproduct Synergy Network and as part of the brainstorming session they said, could we use those plastic drums for any other purposes like transporting uh, hazardous materials or infectious waste? And the answer was yes. They met uh, Department of Transportation standards, uh, safety standards, and so that drum uh, was, was then uh, able to be used for the transportation of solvents. Next slide. So other partners in this uh, byproduct synergy not only included uh, uh, the Pepsi and Mount Carmel, but also a mulch company, a high mulch, and a carbon manufacturer, Calgon Carbon. And I'm not going to be able to spend time going through all the relationships on this chart, but it just shows you uh, the the fact that when you get these these different companies that have totally unrelated business practices, business goals, products in a room working together on how to keep stuff out of a landfill, then you can come up with some really interesting uh, types of uh, uh, new projects to uh, save money and uh, actually help retain uh, employees. Um, but I do want to focus on another use of the Pepsi. Uh, they were taking, again, those used drums that their syrup came in, uh, their sugary syrup, and they, they, those drums were then uh, sent down to Mount Carmel whenever they would send them a load of, uh, of soda for their vending machines. They would throw 10 or 15 of these drums uh, onto the truck at the same time, and that way Mount Carmel could use them. Uh, to transport their solvents. Next slide. Uh, so I'm going to quickly go through, you can read this as well as I can. Uh, the green team uh, has done a lot of different projects over the last three years. So they took on an Earth Day special project this year. They're the, the driving force behind that. And so this was a partnership, if you will, between the hospital and was an outreach to their employees and, and friends of employees, neighbors of employees, uh, as well as the private companies and the nonprofit organizations that were part of this Earth Day project, uh, where they collected electronic waste, paper to be shredded, eyeglasses, and cell phones. It was a very successful project. Next slide. They also... Um, have been working for about three years on uh, composting their organic waste stream, their, their, their um, food scraps, uh, but that also led to the question of could we have our own hospital garden. And so they have started this uh, a year ago. They put in a, a near Mount Carmel East Hospital, and again with the assistance of the private sector, Brickman, uh, who donated seeds and soil. And the green team members volunteered to plant the garden, and the wellness department awards them points for their act outdoor activities that they can use on incentives, the employees of the hospital, and then the herbs and vegetables are donated to the Holy Family Soup Kitchen. So they're they basically closing the loop on that with that outside garden. They intend to make it bigger and use more of the produce in their own uh, hospital uh, uh, food service venues, um, but then as, as you do this gardening, you're going to create waste products, uh, organic waste, and that is leading into, again, the, the concept of being able to either compost on site or at a, at a, a uh, more centralized uh, composting facility, a larger scale facility. Next slide. Um, going away from uh, solid waste uh, for just a second. Again, this is in here because uh, ideas of ride sharing and, and the benefit of that on, on, on the environment in the community is very important. And the Minnow High Regional Planning Commission, who's been a leader in these areas, uh, was working with a hospital trying to create some ride share programs. Uh, and they were pretty far down the stream with it. And I just wanted to point out that uh, External factors such as the dramatic drop in fuel costs uh, really cut the interest in this program, and it was running really high in 
in 2014 and there was hardly any interest to get people to even come to a meeting in 2015. So whether you're talking about carpooling or, or new energy programs or recycling programs, the importance of the analysis is critical. I'm going to uh, just uh, move along here. Uh, you can read these. These will be in your uh, if you're online when you download these. You can see about these, but they participate in community medication disposal, as many hospitals do. Uh, they've recently worked with Ohio State and the students at Ohio State and the Byproducts Energy Network on investigating the recycling of blue wrap from their surgery areas. This is another very important area and uh, is worthy of hospitals uh, working together. Uh, they've done a trash audit at uh, one of their hospitals. They're now expanding that system-wide. They have an interesting project on reuse of batteries coming out of their telemetry projects. Next slide. They're recycling lead aprons. And probably most important of everything, they're investing money in education for their, their employees, their green team members, and they're disseminating what they learn by attending other seminars. And I know many of them are on this webinar today. Next slide. They educate, they put out posters, they make it around the hospital and uh, external meetings. They're letting people know about their, their, what their best practices are and the results of that, uh, their efforts. Next slide. They've created goals for the year. This is very important. Uh, so they're not just uh, sitting back uh, on the programs that they've developed thus far, but they've got some pretty aggressive goals going into the future. And I think the final slide is just in closing. Uh, this is a work in progress. Um, they're, they're really strong on partnering with new vendors. They know the solution is going to be external to the hospital. Uh, and they are focusing not only on the environment, uh, but also a, a new area of safety, health and safety. Uh, and uh, that's now coming become very important to their green team efforts. So that is a, that's a summary of, of how a green team uh, working at a major hospital facility can be the driving force and, and, and to help uh, bring that hospital into saving operating costs, also being protected to the environment, and creating uh, motivation for their employees. I think that's the last slide. Well, thanks, Mike. Um, got a couple of real quick questions for you. Uh, among the folks in the audience who are not healthcare professionals, uh, people are wondering what exactly is red bag waste. They mentioned that. Uh, okay, red bag waste would be waste that is uh, hazardous and, and uh, infectious and needs to be treated away from a standard. Um, uh, facility. It'll go to an infectious waste or hazardous waste incinerator or processor. Thanks. And then one other fast question. Uh, Pepsi was trying to solve the problem of what to do with its drums. It found a secondary use for them, transporting the, the solvent. But what happens to the drums after the um, uh, end of the process when the solvent is uh, sent to the kilns as an energy source? Um, do the drums then continue on that cycle or what happens to them do you know they can be incinerated as well so they oh. become part of the fuel wow so they just get um, turned into fuel whole, whole cloth correct <laughs> well thanks Mike I think that we're going to have some um, questions that will be useful for the panel as a whole to address but uh, before we get to them let's go to our final presenter uh, Britta Harmon who is the Director of Business Operations at Medwish International. And Breta has um, uh, been in that position since uh, November of 2015, but her experience with the organization stretches many years prior to that, having completed a couple of internships. But she oversees the finances, the development, and the human resources aspects of Medwish. 
and brings to that job um, quite an interdisciplinary background uh, with a master's degree in diplomacy and international commerce with a focus on international development. She's got graduate certificates in global health and did her undergraduate studies in French and religious studies. So she'll be talking about the mission of MedWish and discussing the impact that that mission has on the environment as well as the impact on the environment and global health through the organization's partnerships. Britta? Thank you so much and good afternoon everyone. I am very honored to be part of this webinar. Um, and as John just said, I'm going to be representing MedWish International and talking about our mission and also our operations. So I know that we're a little close on time, so I'll make sure to dive right in. Um, so to talk a little bit about how MedWish was founded, we were founded in 1993 by Dr. Lee Ponsky. He spent the summer as a surgical intern prior to going to med school, and he was in Nigeria, and it was while he was there that he was able to see firsthand the scarcity of medical supplies that we have in abundance here in the U.S. So when he returned, he founded MedWish. So we were founded in 1993. We're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we're based in Cleveland. We save lives and the environment by repurposing discarded medical supplies and equipment. And we then, in turn, send those supplies overseas to be used in humanitarian aid in developing countries. So we have a trifold mission. Uh, first, environmental. We're reducing medical waste here in the U.S. Uh, repurposing. We're repurposing those supplies that are still able to be used and then also improving health care for people around the world. We are taking these supplies and then sending them to those who need them the most. So looking at our process, so MedWish recovers usable medical surplus as I said. Last year alone we diverted 582,000 pounds of surplus supplies from landfills. Um, kind of the next step once we get these supplies is sorting those supplies and going through them all to make sure that they are still good and are all able to still be used. We are a small staff. We actually only have 11 full-time staff members, but we have a wonderful base of local volunteers. Last year alone, our volunteers donated over 35,000 volunteer hours to MedWish. Um, part of what our volunteers are doing while they're with us is actually checking to make sure, like I said, that our supplies are still good. MedWish will not send supplies overseas that are not able to still be used. So a lot of times our volunteers are checking the expiration dates to make sure that they are actually within, they're not within a year of expiring. Uh, the reason for that is by the time it gets through our warehouse and our sorting process, then onto a container or in a shipment, then through customs, or maybe if it's going on a ship, a cargo container going overseas, and then finally into the hands of the doctors that need them, we need to make sure that they are still good and still able to be used. Um, so then kind of the final step, this international redistribution, we have recipients all over the world that submit applications to MedWish with their wish list and their need list. Um, those shipments are then packaged into backpacks suitcases, pallets, 40-foot cargo containers. It all depends on our, recipient need, our recipient's needs. Uh, so in 2015, we sent 182 shipments um, full of medical supplies. These all weighed roughly 294,000 pounds of supplies, and they went to 44 different countries. It's pretty incredible to think that the, this almost 300,000 pounds that was sent last year all of those items would have been put into landfills. We estimated that last year the supplies that we sent were able to impact roughly two million people that otherwise wouldn't have had access to those supplies. So who do we get our supplies from? Uh, we work with a wide range of hospitals and healthcare providers. In the last 10 years, we've recovered 3.5 million pounds of medical surplus. Um, and we've worked with nearly 100 hospitals. A lot of our supply donors come from the Cleveland area, um, but we do receive supplies um, from various sources. We also work with hospitals in the Akron area, Columbus, um, and throughout Ohio. We also have individuals that will ship us supplies um, personally as well. And then just a note at the bottom as well that it's estimated that U.S. hospitals generate roughly 5.9 million tons of waste each year. Um, so MedWish is working to recover those supplies that still can be used so they don't end up in those landfills. So to kind of give you a visual of what we do in our warehouse and everything, if you look at the picture on the left-hand side, that's a pallet of supplies that actually came to MedWish from a Columbus hospital. 
Um, we have a healthcare champion, that's what we call the doctors or nurses or individuals that work in specific hospitals, clinics, doctors' offices, um, that spread the word about MedWish, about what kinds of supplies we can take um, to help encourage people not to throw those items away. Um, so that pallet of supplies, we get a pallet or we get a shipment from that hospital about once a month. Um, and those supplies then are brought into our inventory and able to be sent out. Um, the picture up at the top, you can see wheelchairs that are there. Although we do get much of our supplies from hospitals, doctor's offices, clinics, things like that, we do get donations as well from individuals. So if a loved one has passed away or if you no longer need a certain supply that you had, so for example, if you sprained your ankle in high school and you have crutches sitting in your basement that you've had for years, and you don't want them anymore, you can bring them to our warehouse and they'll go into our inventory as well. Down at the bottom, you can see um, there's backpacks and also boxes of diapers. Um, that was actually a shipment that went with a group of high school students from the Cleveland area that were going to the Dominican Republic this past winter. And they took all of these supplies to go to a clinic that they were visiting while they were there. And then on the right-hand side, you can see a container that was getting shipped out. And this is full of, you can see mattresses, you can see beds. Um, oftentimes our recipients, when they have these larger containers coming to them, um, they will be getting these larger items so that they can furnish their hospitals, clinics, things like that. And these are items that are no longer needed by our hospitals. Um, and like I said, they can come to us, so then they can get sent to those who need them. So like I said, MedWish's goal is to have as little um, go into the landfills and get thrown away as possible. So we also do alternative recycling and reprocessing. So kind of what is our alternative recycling? These are items that cannot be used for a medical reason, so they might be non-sterile or maybe they are expired, but they can be used though for other means that are non-medical. So for example, we have humane societies that will come to us and get non-sterile drapes or surgical gloves that can be used um, in the animal exams. Or we'll have nursing schools that can come and get certain items for us so that nurses can learn how to use those items on dummies um, or in practice. We also have after school programs and art programs that will come to us to get tongue depressors, cotton balls, or sponges that can be used in arts programs. Um, like I said, these are all items that our recipients can't use, um, but they are still good and can be used in other ways. Then we also have reprocessing. There are certain items that are donated to MedWish that our recipients would not be able to make appropriate use of. Um, so we do have approved reprocessing vendors that can take those items. These are things like high-end endoscopic or laparoscopic surgical equipment or actually suture as well. Um, so rather than these items sitting on our shelves until they expire and then in turn we would need to throw them away, um, we do work to um, get these sent to these reprocessing um, vendors so that um, they can then be used, um, but also MedWish can receive money for these items, which then goes right back into our mission to help us to continue sending these supplies overseas to those who need them. So to give you a little bit of or a couple facts about our alternative recycling and reprocessing, in 2015, we shipped 7,434.5 pounds of alternative recycling supplies and 1,327 pounds of material to be reprocessed. Once again, all these things would have otherwise been thrown away, but we were able to find alternative uses for them. And then just a couple of the partners that we work with, um, humane societies, um, schools in the Cleveland area, like I said, and these reprocessing vendors. Um, and this is our founder, Dr. Lee Ponsky, and just kind of the idea that with one good idea, like I said, he noticed the scarcity of medical supplies while he was um, serving as an intern in Nigeria and brought that idea back home to Cleveland uh, and has been able to make a really profound impact not only on the environment here in Cleveland uh, but also on people's health around the world. So thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate uh, being invited to be part of this webinar and I welcome any questions that anyone may have but I know we are running close on time so I'll hand it back over to John. Thanks. I do think that we have time for at least one round of comments and a common theme that has gone through the questions that we receive from our attendees raises the question of the specific restraints and challenges in the healthcare sector that, it, that relate to recycling. So for example, uh, at a community hospital level, we're encouraging people to bring reusable containers uh, to cut down on cafe waste. Does, does that raise a discussion with the 
infection prevention team. The uh, necessity of using batteries that are completely fresh to ensure the performance of the, the device uh, leads to a lot of battery waste. I thought we'd go around real fast and, and start with Sydney, who's on the front line of these things, and ask them to comment on what are the unique challenges in the healthcare sector that are obstacles to fulfilling zero waste goals. Sydney, do you have a, some ideas? Yeah, I mean, for one, the reusable container, we actually, it's, it's on the materials in there, but we had to retract that. Our infection prevention, so whoever made that comment, that's a, that was a really good call out because we did have to pull back on that. Interesting. Um, and because of our health codes. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's always the first thing that gets asked. Um, we have a lot of challenges. I think the Mount Carmel team is, uh, very advanced, and I applaud them, but we, we are asking some of those same questions about surgical packing, just because it's it's part of the surgery set. Why can't we recycle some of that packaging? So it's it's a it's a constant question, yeah. And it's almost the first question that we have to ask is is there a safety issue? Is we have to plan on so Mike, in, in your work, have you discovered opportunities for innovation or technology to help some of those, solve some of those problems? So for example, if there was a, a battery testing technology that could pass a, a, a standard, would that preserve the use of batteries or, uh, in the hospital setting? Or any, any other situation that you've observed where a new innovation or technology might solve a problem in the healthcare sector with regard to recycling? Well, with the batteries, um, that's a that's a really good uh, issue uh, to to think about because the, what they're trying to do right now at Mount Carmel is find ways to recycle those batteries. Their policy says that they have to use fresh batteries. So, if we had a standard that we could test that and and we felt that it was reliable, I'm sure that would cut down on that waste. The cross contamination is another huge issue. And part of it's perception. Um, taking food, for example, out of a patient's room to have it composted, is that a safe thing to do or not? And uh, the chain of custody is something that we need to be very careful with. And so there may be some technology that helps us uh, do a better job of managing uh, things like food scraps, which is a huge cost and amount of waste coming out of a hospital. Interesting challenges. Uh, Britta, you get the last word. Um, I know that in the world of medical waste, um, you know, there's a lot of usable supplies that you really can't use because of regulations or policies around safety and, and like that. Um, and are there observations you have that would maximize the ability of a hospital system to repurpose some of its medical supplies through an organization like yours? Well, we do have, like I said, we do have champions that work in different healthcare um, centers and different doctor's offices and things like that. And we do try and provide them with um, lists of the types of supplies that we can take because it, kind of in this discussion, as you're saying, there are certain items that for various reasons we cannot accept or we don't accept. Um, so we do certainly work with our champions to be able to give them kind of up-to-date information on what they can and cannot send to us and a lot of that's based on what we can send overseas and also a lot of it too is like I said a race against time to make sure it doesn't expire um, by the time we're able to get it into the hands of those that need it. Thanks Brad. In the interest of respecting our attendees times I think we have reached our full cycle. I want to thank once again um, uh, the Center for uh, Environment, Economy and um, Energy, the Environment, and the Economy for organizing this and for the Zero Waste Initiative with the Bonavich School and Rural Action for the whole initiative and especially our panels for opening up insight and questions into the healthcare sector and the way that zero waste plays a role there. And thanks for everybody for attending and please um, keep your eye on your email for the evaluation form and link that will be sent soon. Thanks everybody.